Now, as we conclude this series, Real Life, I want you to be in prayer for next Sunday. The Lord willing, we'll begin a brand new series entitled Breaking Point. When the Holy Spirit helps us to break through when we're about to break down. The Lord gave me this series back in last September, and I think it's timely as we will look at all of the emotions that we are experiencing in this current crisis and what the Bible has to say about those emotions and how the Holy Spirit can help us to overcome and have a breakthrough. And I'm excited about what the Lord is going to do in that series. But today we finish the series Real Life by addressing real life in the context of the last days. In this regard, Paul describes real life in the last days both in the world and in the church in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read this from the Amplified Version. And I think you'll relate to where we are in these last days. But understand this, that in the last days, dangerous times of great stress and trouble will come. Difficult days that will be hard to bear. For people will be lovers of self, narcissistic, self-focused, lovers of money impelled by greed, boastful, arrogant, revelers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and lawless. Headlines from this morning's news. American mayhem, lawlessness in cities across the U.S. In Austin, where someone was shot and killed. In Portland, Seattle, Los Angeles, Aurora, Colorado, Omaha, Nebraska, Chicago, Louisville, Kentucky, Oakland, California, and the list goes on of last night how lawlessness took over many cities. They will be unloving, devoid of natural human affection, calloused and inhumane, irreconcilable, malicious gossipers, devoid of self-control, intemperate, immoral, brutal, haters of good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of sensual pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of outward godliness religion, although they have denied its power, for their conduct nullifies their claim of faith. Can you say we're living in these last days? He just described the world and the lukewarm church. Jesus addressed the lukewarm church in Revelation chapter 3, the church of the last days, by calling them lukewarm. But we know according to 2 Timothy that this lukewarm church will have a great falling away and their hearts will grow cold in a great falling away or apostasy. We also know that the lukewarm church will grow hot as revival is prophesied in Joel, that in the last days he'll pour out his spirit on all flesh, and there will be a great revival in the last days. And so in these last days, there's going to be two distinct voices, the voice of apostasy or the voice of revival. Right now, like never before, the church has a platform to step up to the microphone of influence and proclaim that Jesus Christ is the answer to this world's dilemma. But this world is not hearing because they're hearing two different confusing voices. On the one hand, they're hearing the voice of the apostate church. And on the other hand, they're hearing the voice of the true church, the church that's on fire, the church that believes the Bible is God's final authority of his word. I did some research and looked at some websites of user-friendly churches in these last days. Here are descriptions on websites or social media pages of churches in America. They represent that prophecy that's coming true where there's a great falling away. Churches who worship 
the audience, instead of the one. Listen to this advertisement for these churches, and this is just a sample. Here's an advertisement on a website. There is no fire or brimstone here, just practical, witty messages. Here's another one. Our services have an informal feeling. You won't hear people threatened with sin or hell or referred to as sinners. The goal here is to make them feel welcome, not drive them away. Here's another. As with all clergymen, our pastor's answer is God. But he, but he, but he slips him in at the end, and even then doesn't get heavy. No ranting, no raving, no fire, no brimstone, no sin. He doesn't even use the H word. We call it light gospel, like a Miller light. It's the same salvation as the old time religion, but with a third less guilt. Here's some more. Our sermons are relevant, upbeat, and best of all, short. <laughs> Don't be tempted. You won't hear a lot of preaching about sin and damnation or hellfire. Preaching here doesn't sound like preaching. It's sophisticated, urban, conversational, and friendly talk. It breaks all the stereotypes. And just one more, indulge me. Our pastor preaches a very upbeat message. It's a salvation message, but the idea is not so much being saved from sin or the fires of hell. Rather, it's being saved from meaninglessness and aimlessness in this world. It's more of a soft sell. This COVID crisis has tested us, us, Rose Heights, whether we worship an audience of one or whether we worship an audience that's full. Yeah, I miss the synergy of a full house. It's real. It's true. I miss gathering around the altar, laying hands on one another and praying for each other. I miss praying for you individually here at church. I miss all of that. But there is something going on in each individual life, a stripping down, a, 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 a personal trial that each of us are going through, a trial by fire, to see whether we truly worship the Lord Jesus Christ or we worship the church. And I am proud to say and thankful to say that I believe for the most part, Rose Heights is passing the test because I'm in touch with you. The pastors are in touch with you. And we thank the Lord for what he's doing in our lives individually and corporately. He's taking us through a test. And if we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, we will pass the test. The real life in this real world and these last days are startling. Oftentimes, persecution of the church comes through government, but catch this, most of the time, persecution of believers comes from the church. You see this in the early church, you see this in the Middle Ages, and you see it yesterday in the news. Headlines in the news yesterday. UK Christian ministry receives death threats, loses bank accounts after mob rule campaign, and it will be churches next. A Christian ministry in the United Kingdom said it received death threats and had had its accounts shut down after a mob rule campaign by LGBTQ activists accusing it of conversion counseling. Core Issues Trust, CIT, 
a nonprofit Christian ministry that supports men and women who voluntarily seek change in sexual preferences and expression after Christian conversion was targeted at the end of June as the UK seeks to ban conversion experiences. Earlier this week, Barclays Bank notified CIT that it was closing the group's accounts after several companies took action against the group. MailChimp and PayPal suspended its services, and both Facebook and Instagram removed content from its pages. The UK's Government Equalities Office responded to an online petition with more than 200,000 signatures to ban the conversion experience. A gay, evangelical, Anglican pastor is leading the charge in Britain, accusing CIT of being a practicer and promoter of the conversion experience. You're not here, but you can hear a pin drop in the room here. Because we realize that in these last days, we already see a great falling away from the truth. We see the apostate church rising up to present its false gospel. But hang in there. Here's the good news. The Holy Spirit helps us to reimagine, rebuild, and restore real life rubble or the rubble of real life. Hang on. Rejoice. If I, if I could just preach this message in one sentence, it wouldn't be, oh, God, help us. And I know you think that's where we're going, but it's not. If I could preach this message in one sentence, it's rejoice. Revival is on the way. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, for the clarity of your word, for the Holy Spirit opening our eyes to the real life of this world and the situation that we're in. God, I pray for the next few moments we would be able to focus on the reality of revival, that you would burn within our hearts this desire to be a part of the movement in these last days where you will revive your church. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Rejoice. Revival is on the way. Now, all of us have these images and concepts of what we think of as revival. Many of us were raised in church when we would have a revival, that is a series of messages or a series of services. And we would all gather. When I was a kid, it lasted till about 12 o'clock midnight, sometimes one o'clock in the morning. I dreaded revival because it was hard to get up to go to school the next day. But those revivals were powerful. But let me tell you something. Revival is not just a series of services. It's not just a movement. It is an individual experience where someone who is a believer that's living like an unbeliever whose heart has stopped beating for God, whose passion for prayer and the word has grown cold. It is a revival of that spirit that brings that person back to life again. It's the moving of the Holy Spirit to wake up a dead church. It's the moving of the Holy Spirit to shake us to reality and tell us that Jesus is coming soon and we need to begin to have passion for the Lord like never before. That, dear ones, is what revival is all about. It's not something that, that you can create. It, it's not a movement somewhere else. Revival is a reality that's possible in your heart. And when you accept revival in your own heart, you're like a spark 
This sparks a fire, and that fire is the movement of the Holy Spirit, and he works in our lives, in our churches, in our communities, and sets us apart and causes us to be a strong voice of conviction in these last days. That's what revival is. It starts with prayer. Always, every great awakening, every great revival in history has started with prayer. Let me show you a little taste of the revival that's starting to spread throughout the world. I'm going to show you these spontaneous prayer meetings on the streets of the world. Here's one from Brazil. If you go to YouTube and Google prayer in the streets, you will see an extraordinary movement that's beginning to happen throughout the world, not just in Brazil, but in many, many countries, including Nigeria, Kenya, India, many countries in Europe. It's just a spontaneous eruption of people who are so desperate for God that they just hit their knees in the streets of these cities and begin crying out to God, and one spark lights another. And before you know it, many people in these cities are crying out to God. Even in Tyler, Texas, I've never seen it before, but in the last three months, we've had three prayer meetings on, or the last month, we've had three prayer meetings on the square of this town. I'm telling you, revival is beginning to spark, and I want to be a part of the revival movement in these last days. But Nehemiah, could I just take you to a revival service in Nehemiah chapter 8? Because they have finished the wall in a miraculous 52 days. And instead of resting, instead of relaxing, instead of think, thinking, well, that was hard, that was tough, but we finished and now it's done, they asked themselves the question, what's next? We know that it was a supernatural act of God to help us to build this wall. Now we want to know that God. We want to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We want to hear the law of Moses. We're second generation captives and we've not been in Jerusalem before. So can we go back to the beginning and start all over and ask God to send us a revival? And that's exactly what happened. It gives us Four R's, R's, I just chose R's to help you remember, four keys to revival, and they all start with the letter R, beginning with a revived appetite for Scripture. The first R in bringing revival to your own personal life is a revived appetite for reading Scripture and for understanding Scripture and for opening this book. Did you think for one second you were going to get to come to church and not hear me harp on reading the Bible? Of course not. It is the first key to your own personal fire revival experience. Verse number 1 in chapter 8. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate... 
And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. The Bible goes on to say in this chapter that when he opened the book, they all stood to their feet and they stood there for six hours listening to the word of God. I I thought about trying that one day, but then I caught myself out of it. Can you imagine such a hunger to hear the word of God that when the word of God was spoken, when they rolled out the scroll and they spoke the word of God, everybody immediately, spontaneously, men, women, and children stood to their feet and they stood there and they listened to the word of God for six hours. Something extraordinary came to my mind this past week as I looked at verse four. Anytime the Bible lists names, it's unique especially in the context of reading the scriptures. So there are many times in the Bible when names are listed, if you look up the meaning of names, it preaches another message. It's an underlying truth. It it, it takes you deeper into the amazing scriptures. And so we find that in verse number four of chapter eight. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him, At his right hand stood Mattathiah, means gift. Shema, means hear words. Aniah, means answer. Urijah, means from light. Hilkiah, means portion. And Maasiah, means work. And at his left hand, Padiah, means redemption. Mishael means of God. Melchijah means the king. Hashem means silence. Hashpadana means judgment. Zechariah means remembers. And Meshulam means his friend. If you take the meanings of those names and you roll out the meanings of those names in a sentence, The ones on the right side spell out this sentence. The gift to hear the words was an answer from the light for the portion of their work. Did you catch that? Summarizes what's going on and what's just happened. Just the meaning of their names spelled out in a sentence. This is the word of God we're talking about. This is a super natural book. The ones on his left side, you roll out the meanings of their names in a sentence and it reads like this. The redemption of God the King silences his judgment and remembers his friend. Basically, it's talking about his friend Abraham and the covenant that he had with Abraham. And he said, I will bring my, he, he's fulfilling the prophecy. I will stop the judgment of captivity. I will bring my people back because I remember my covenant with Abraham. When you look at the Bible and you read these words, your mind and your eyes read one thing, but your spirit gets another. I've said this a thousand times and now it's going to be a thousand and one. When you read the scripture, your mind may not comprehend everything that there is to comprehend, but your spirit is lapping it up like a thirsty dog. It's lapping up the word, and it's filling your spirit with the washing of the water of the word and causing your spirit person to be strong in the Lord. The first part, the first component, the first step for you to be revived is to develop a hunger for the word like you've never had before. Number two, a realization of the greatness of God. Verse number six, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, amen, amen, while lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Isaiah 40 says something about the greatness of God. Listen to these words. I'm just going to read them to you. To whom then will you liken unto me 
that I should be his equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Through the incredible invention of the Hubble telescope, we can see the seen universe. And in that seen universe, scientists tell us that there are approximately 100 billion galaxies. And each of those 100 billion galaxies have approximately 100 billion stars, much greater than our own sun. And that's just what Hubble can see. The Bible says that Jesus, or that God put those stars in their place, named each one of them, knows them by name. Another place it says that he holds the universe in the palm of his hand. You serve a great God. When you compare your problem with his greatness, there is no comparison. I want you to know that even though God exists outside of time and space, he looks through time and space to this little blue planet called Earth, all the way down to Tyler, Texas, looking at this crowd of people here this morning and watching you online, and he knows every need that you have, even before you ask it. The scripture says that he knows every thought that you think, even before you think it. He knows every hair on your head if you have hair. And he's got them all numbered. He loves you. He cares for you. So it's time for us to say, great is our God. And when we realize the greatness of God, it causes us to fall on our face and realize that even though we're in this crisis, God is greater than the crisis. And even though we look at the news and the news is, is, is distraught, if we look at it, we realize that God is in control. He doesn't look at the news every morning and slap his head and say, what am I going to do now? The devil has made a move. Now it's my move. No, it's already been checkmate a long time ago. God is just watching it all unfold according to his will because he's that great. We take comfort in that kind of control. That's the kind of God we serve. And all of these things are happening just as God planned for his purpose. The second thing about revival is it causes us to realize the greatness of God. But let me tell you something. When you really get that realization and you realize that that great God has invited you into his presence for a conversation, it is humbling and it is awesome. This great God, through the finished work of Jesus Christ, has invited us to make our petitions known to him with thanksgiving in our heart, to come into his presence on a daily basis and just sit down and talk with that great God in the name of Jesus. That is an incredible privilege. Listen, starting in August, we're going to join the prayer movement, and we're going to begin on August the 3rd, a 21-day prayer and fasting prayer season where we're going to open up this sanctuary at noontime, and we're going to pray through the book of Daniel. We're going to give a five-minute devotion on the book of Daniel, on some passages in Daniel. Then we're going to pray for a theme. Then we're going to have some worship. We're going to give handouts of prayer requests. And if you have any opportunity to come and share that time with us from August the 3rd through August the 23rd, we're going to have a wonderful time of prayer and fasting asking God to have his will and his way. And then on August the 23rd, when we gather here that Sunday, we're going to have prayer and worship. The whole service is just going to be worship and prayer. And we're going to celebrate what God has done in that 21 days of prayer and fasting. I believe God's going to show up. It's an absolutely incredible privilege. But don't wait till August the 3rd to pray. 
begin today. Don't let this service take the place of your prayer time today. Find yourself a place and visit with the great God. You don't have to go before him on every, uh, the same time every day, although that's a great discipline. You can pray to him anytime, anywhere. He just longs to hear your voice. Sometimes I go into the presence of God and I don't even say a thing. This past week, I just took a walk with the Lord and I said, God, I'm just going to be quiet. You know my heart. I love you. Just speak to me and just walk with me. And for that whole time, I was just completely silent, listening to the, to the words of the Holy Spirit as he brought scriptures to my mind. Prayer is different. Prayer is not some kind of ritual. Prayer is a simple conversation that you have with God. Sometimes it's loud, sometimes it's quiet, sometimes it's silent. But when you realize how great God is and this same great God has invited you for communion, you kind of show up. If you had an appointment with your doctor and you realize how busy doctors are these days, you would show up. If you had an appointment with someone else who could help you, you would show up. Well, there's nobody that can help you greater than God. And God has invited you to a daily appointment. The question is, will you show up? I'm convinced that when you realize and remind yourself of the greatness of God, you will show up. Number three, a radical application of biblical truth. I said a few minutes ago that you can read the Bible and not understand it, but your spirit gets it. That doesn't negate our responsibility to meditate on the word and to study the word and try to understand the word. Otherwise, it just becomes another spiritual ritual. We have been given absolutely amazing resources at our very fingertips. We provide a ministry called Right Now Media. You can go into Right Now Media, type any subject, and hear a message on that particular subject, a breakdown of the Scripture. There's Bible studies, there's thousands of Bible studies. The question is, are you taking advantage of the resources that God has given us, given us to understand His Word? Because, listen, that understanding is absolutely necessary. In, in verse 7 and 8, it says, And the Levites helped the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God. And they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. It has been Satan's goal throughout time to distort the word of God. He did it in the garden by saying, hath God said? In the early church, Jesus wrote to the church of Smyrna, and he said this. He said, for 10 days, you're going to have tribulation and persecution. Now, it was more than 10 days. 10 days was representative of 10 seasons of persecution for the early church through 10 different emperors. The last one persecuted the church for 10 years from 303 to 313. You know what? Every emperor persecuted the church with this in mind, they, they wanted to destroy the word of God. The last one from 313 or 303 to 313 had one goal. Go from house to house, destroy every copy of the scriptures that you can possibly find. It has been the strategy of Satan since the beginning of time to cause you not to desire or understand the word of God. In the Dark Ages, they call it the Dark Ages because the apostate church then would not allow commoners to read the scripture in their language. They only heard it in a language they couldn't understand. And the reason for this is because the apostate church tried to control the people. When somebody came along like John Wycliffe and wanted to write the scriptures in the common language so that people could understand the scriptures, it was outlawed and the apostate church persecuted the true church, people who loved the scriptures and people who wanted to know the scriptures and killed thousands upon thousands of Christians because they wanted to understand the word. 
And here we are in 2020 with the Word of God and all of the resources at our literal fingertips to understand the Scriptures. But be careful. You can't believe everything you read on the Internet. Have I said that before? There are some people who are saying things that the Scripture does not say. You've got to make sure that the resource is reliable. God has given us all of these resources, and the third reason is to understand the Scripture and apply it to our lives. Number four, a repentant heart. Verse number nine, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra, the priest and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy unto the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep, because all the people wept when they heard the words of of the law. Would you stand with me, please? When you develop an insatiable desire to read the Word and you spend time with God, the Holy Spirit is going to reveal the truth of the Word and make application to your life, and it will convict you and break your heart and cause you to realize, oh God, I need you like never before. When those four things happen to you individually, you will be revived in your spirit like never before, and your spark will ignite another. And people will see a difference in your attitude, in your expression, and they'll wonder what in the world happened to you. How can you be so full of joy in such an environment? They will desire what you have. Here's what I know. Revival brings joy. Revival brings joy. Not just the happy feeling of joy. That's not what joy is. Joy is not a feeling. Joy comes from the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that can provide joy, which is supernatural peace in the midst of turmoil. Revival then will bring you supernatural peace and hope in the midst of turmoil and will do its work. Here's what revival does. It replaces compromise with confession. It replaces selfishness with service and complacency with commitment. That is the result of joy that's brought on by revival. Revival then is not some happy whoop de doo feeling. Revival is a true transformation of your spirit that becomes an incredible light to this very dark world. And when there's a spark in this congregation, it ignites another spark. And before you know it, we are on fire. That's what God wants to do in all of our lives. And it starts with me, it starts with you, it starts individually. The question is, do you desire it? Are you willing? to ask God to bring those four components of revival to your heart. At this point, wish I could give an altar call and say, everybody that's willing, come to the front. And I just lay hands on you and pray for you. But maybe the Lord has designed it this way, that we are socially distanced because it's gonna be a work between you and God, between you and the Holy Spirit. Just bow your head and close your eyes, would you, Lord? Speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Burn within us, Lord, a desire to have a hunger for your word like never before. Holy Spirit, reveal to us the greatness of God and draw us to his presence on a daily basis to receive strength and peace and comfort and provision and just worship you for who you are. And Holy Spirit, reveal the word like never before. Help us to see the layers of meanings 
as we dig into the Word and meditate on the Word and understand what's going on in these last days. And Father, break our heart for what breaks yours. God, help us to be purged by the fire of your Spirit, cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus and washed with the water of your Word. Lord, I know that you are coming back for a pure and holy church, a bride that's spotless and clean. So God, I pray that you would purify us with your fire, with revival. Lord, let it begin in each one of us. Use us for your glory like never before. We humbly submit ourselves to you. Just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If there's anyone in this room or if there's anyone watching online or by broadcast and you are terrified when you read the news because it seems so confusing, I want you to know that there is a God in heaven who's in control and he wants to save you. And if you don't have the assurance of your salvation, you don't know for sure that if Jesus were to come back today that you would go with him or that if you were to die today, you would wake up in heaven. You can know beyond a shadow of a doubt all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The scripture puts it this way. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And with simple childlike faith, because Jesus said, unless you come to the, him as a child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. So come to him with a childlike faith. Believe that he hears your prayer as simple as it may be. And he will and he will forgive your sins and he will save your soul, and he will write your name in the Lamb's book of life so that when you see a holy God, he will not see your sins, but he will see the righteousness of Jesus Christ through the finished work of the cross. That's all you have to do. Pray a prayer like this. Jesus, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be Lord of my life. And from this day forward, Lord, help me to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ and help me to fulfill the purpose for which you allowed me to be born and that is to bring you glory. Lord, help me, save me. And just like that, it's done. If you need prayer, just let us know. Roseheights.org, click on connect card, let us know. And we'll pray for you and send you resources. Do you love him, church? He's good to us, isn't he? Quote this scripture with me, would you please? Love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, even so come Lord Jesus.